Welcome to MuggleCast, your weekly ride into the Wizarding World. I'm Andrew. I'm Micah. Sorry, I, I didn't know what to do there, Andrew. <laughs> Where's Eric? <laughs> I, Eric is off for his birthday. Oh, that's right. He threw me through a loop, though. I, I, I wasn't expecting to go second. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Laura. <laughs> And we're joined by Pat again this week. Hi, Pat. Welcome back to the show. Hey, everyone. Subbing for Eric this week. On today's episode, we will be discussing Chapter 26 of Order of the Phoenix, Seen and Unforeseen. And we also have some muggle mail. But first, just wanted to let everybody know we did our third installment of Quizage Live on Sunday. We're actually recording this episode on Saturday, but I assume Quizage Live 3 went really well. Quizage oh, yeah. three. It's fantastic. The prisoner of knowledge. Now, Eric will be here for that. He said, I just want one MuggleCast thing to do this weekend instead of two. So he picked Quizage. Yeah, I mean, it's his birthday, to be fair. It was on Thursday. So, you know, he can have the week off and we get Pat. So, I mean, it, honestly, it's a win win. Yeah. <laughs> Eric gets a break. Pat comes on the show. It's great. <laughs> Yeah, so, and speaking of Eric, he had that idea for the um, Neville Longbottom playlist, and we now have over 60 songs in the playlist on Spotify, so we'll have another link in the show notes if you want to check that out and uh, get pumped up with songs Neville may listen to while um, kicking butt in Dumbledore's army. Can you do one at random, just, uh, or am I putting you on the spot? Um, I'm interested to see what people add. How about this song? Can you hear this? Yep. Let me skip ahead. You know who who this is, Micah? I do not. <laughs> do you want to take a guess? Take a guess. I'd say like Kesha. <laughs> Close. Britney Spears. <laughs> Really? really? Brittany, wow. Yeah. What happened oh, Laura, to her? you didn't know either? No. That was work. Oh, it. I, wow. By Brittany. I didn't know that she could get any more auto tune. Oh, come on. That's a good song. I think that's off of Brittany Jean. Oh, okay. Anyway, so yeah, check out that playlist and feel inspired. Here's a fun question, turning to Muggle Mail now. This is from Mira. Hi, MuggleCast. I am really enjoying your show, and I am currently listening to some recent ones on repeat. Yesterday, I actually ran into my mom's parked car on a bike while listening to it. <laughs> I hope you're okay. Wow. And your yeah. mom's car, too. Be safe, please. Helmet, <laughs> I hope. Helmet. Helmet. Maybe some training wheels. <laughs> this yeah. is scary, because we had feedback from someone a few months ago about how they got into a car accident while they were listening to us, right? Yes. And didn't we deem that episode cursed? <laughs> Probably. I hope Mira wasn't listening to that episode. If she was, that'd be crazy. Anyway, she says, I was wondering what you think would happen at Hogwarts because of COVID-19. Keep doing what you're doing. I absolutely love the podcast. It is like having a Harry Potter fan as a friend, which I don't have. Just my middle school English teacher. Aw, thank you so much. So how would Hogwarts deal with COVID-19? Would there be like a quarantine of some sort at the school? I just think they'd all be walking around with bubble head charms on. Yeah. Yeah. Agreed. Would they be confined to their dormitories? No. I mean, we've already established that Hogwarts is a security nightmare. So I don't know that they would uh, quarantine to the extent that we are in the muggle world. But I think you also have a note here uh, from WizardingWorld.com about wizarding abilities to heal muggle illnesses. Yeah. So J.K. Rowling wrote about illnesses and disabilities way back on back in the day on PotterNoMore.com. And she said that wizards can deal with muggle illnesses, but they they can deal with them easily. So in the case of COVID-19, they would be able to avoid it, I think. However, uh, serious injuries and illnesses that are exclusive to the wizarding world, they have to really fight those. That makes sense. They would be smarter mm -hmm. than I us. I feel like quarantining would qualify more towards the professors because the students really can't leave. Like they probably wouldn't be able to go to Hogsmeade, but the professors can like come and go from the castle kind of as much as they want. Mm -hmm. I think quarantining would really only apply to them. And to be honest, it sounds like Umbridge is just her own version of COVID-19 with everything she's doing to lock down the school. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Accurate. But Hogwarts is also very large, so there's more room to spread out, I feel. It's way bigger than any school we know. So 
I think they'd be able to keep six feet from each other in the corridors and whatnot. Anyway, this next email is from Meg, who is actually Eric's girlfriend. And I thought, well, since it's Eric's birthday weekend, we have to include this. (laughs) Meg said, happy Thursday, which, by the way, was Eric's birthday. I have ruminated on some similarities between Harry Potter and Rubius Hagrid, getting back to our discussion from last week. And these are pretty funny. She said, untidy hair, not so great with the ladies, (laughs) friends with a big black dog, (laughs) can both see Thestrals. Both think Lucius Malfoy is a great A, you know what. Both think Draco Malfoy is a sniveling punk and personal history with Tom Riddle. Yeah. She should be on the show. I mean, th- these are better answers than Eric gave. <laughs> <laughs> they were clever. They were clever. We have a new sponsor here at MuggleCast. Another clothing recommendation for you, actually. Me Undies. Me Undies are the makers of the most comfortable and surprising underwear and loungewear. Their name, of course, tells you they're known for their undies, but just as comfortable are their lounge pants, their shirts, their robes, and their onesies. Laura and I have been longtime fans of Me Undies. What immediately grabs your attention is all of their adventurous prints. You can get underwear designs with peaches, pandas, pizzas, all kinds of vibrant designs, or you can go with simple or bold single colors. Oh, yeah. These are great. Um, I have so many fun designs. My favorite ones are um, the ones that have glow-in-the-dark jellyfish on them. I think Mm. you have those, too, you said, Andrew. Yes. Yeah. And they're just, they're so comfy. Yeah. They're so comfortable. And also, no panty lines for people who are concerned about that. So, Mm. good choices. Yeah. Correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems like a mix between, like, silk and cotton. No, I think that it is... um, made from clouds clouds to <laughs> to to cradle to cradle your delicate places i see oh, okay um it's it's just soft yeah yeah it really is soft in a unique way it's unlike anything i've worn before and it's one of those things where when you try it you wonder where have these been all my life what also makes them unique is they have a membership program you can build your own packs or you can buy matching pairs for you and a friend or a loved one MeUndies has a great offer for our listeners. For any first-time purchasers, you get 15% off and free shipping. This is a no-brainer, especially because they have a 100% satisfaction guarantee. You've got nothing to lose. Being stuck in the house right now, you probably want to freshen up your day-to-day life. MeUndies are a great way to do that. To get 15% off your first order, free shipping, a 100% satisfaction guarantee, go to MeUndies.com slash MuggleCast. That's MeUndies.com slash MuggleCast. And thank you, MeUndies, for supporting this week's episode. Maybe Dobby should order some of these. Or another house elf. Maybe Harry should give give them to Dobby. There you go. Is that how we're setting house elves free now? Yeah. With Giving MeUndies. Me undies. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> free your house elf with MeUndies. Anyway, MeUndies.com slash MuggleCast. Check them out. We really think you'll like them. Now it's time for Chapter by Chapter, and this week we're discussing Order of the Phoenix, Chapter 26, Seen and Unforeseen. And we'll start, as always, with our seven-word summary, and Pat, you will kick things off. Try not to start with Harry. Okay. Um, let's start with dreams. Enter. Laura. <laughs> Did we lose Laura? I think we lost Laura. Can you hear me now? <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. There you okay. Are. The mind through dreams enter the mind through. We're out of time. That's it. Well, I know we also couldn't hear you. So oh, I feel like we should. Seconds. Uh, dreams enter the mind through. I don't even. I have no clue where this could possibly go. Snapes. <laughs> Lessons. There you go. Okay, cool. That's pretty good. Yeah. I like it. It'll suffice for today. All right, let's talk about chapter 26, seen and unforeseen. And we're not going to go through it in order. I broke it out a little bit differently. I wanted to start off by talking about the Quibbler. And uh, we all know Harry had his interview with Rita Skeeter at towards the end of the last chapter. And immediately... There's a little bit of concern that Harry's story is being held for a feature on Crumplehorn Snorkax. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it's funny. It's Luna. It's the love goods. But I think, at least as a reader, should we be concerned 
for the legitimacy of this publication if we weren't already, given right. that Harry's story is a little bit more important than uh, these beasts. And I think it serves as one more reminder that maybe Harry didn't make the best decision. He finds this out that they're waiting on this feature on these creatures. And Harry might be like, you know, maybe this wasn't the best idea. (laughs) I have this big interview. I'm waiting for it to come out. It's going to change everything potentially. And they're obsessed with the Crumplehorn Snorkax. What strikes me about this is that Xenophilius seems to not really understand the enormity of this interview and i would think he would want to drop everything and prioritize this interview with harry you know i think from a reader perspective though this serves to make the payoff that much better when we see how this is received later on in the chapter exactly i agree speaking of rita skeeter how much legitimacy is she providing here to the story? We know the Quibbler is is not the best resource for information, but Rita provides another level. We know that she was a bit of a tabloid writer for the Daily Prophet, but I actually think that her involvement in this lends a lot of legitimacy to Harry's story. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. She had such a strong following in the previous book like how many people emailed or not not emailed geez (laughs) how many people sent Hermione like owls in like just berating her when they thought like that she was with Harry and like all that kind of stuff just because of something that Rita wrote so Rita has a following and I think that that helps the story immensely it's a shame that we didn't get to read Rita's story because you also wonder if there are some Rita-isms in, in this article. Presumably not, because Hermione's got her under her thumb. But I, I would have really loved to have read it. We just get the headline, and that's it. Yeah, and the fact that she wasn't allowed to use her quick quotes, Quill. Mm-hmm. And, and it's a knock against the Daily Prophet as well, right? We, we talked about them in the last episode and how they're really being a mouthpiece for the ministry, but... The fact that one of their more prominent writers goes over to a publication like The Quibbler to tell a story like this is really a a bit of a knock on them. Yeah, it is. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Now, Pat touched on all of the owls showing up, and um, Harry gets a number of uh, pieces of feedback from some readers at The Quibbler, but uh, it wasn't long before Umbridge shows up at the uh, breakfast table to ask what it was that they were all looking at. And man, is she pissed. (laughs) That was the ultimate mic drop moment for Harry. It says that he tossed the quibbler at her. I just envisioned him like, yeah, oh, it was great. (laughs) But she ends up giving him a week's worth of detention and banning him from Hogsmeade. And I guess in Harry's mind, it was all worth it. But I kind of wondered here, does she have the authority to pass down this punishment? I, she hasn't even read the article. Presumably, she's only seen the headline. So she doesn't really know what it says. And it seems like a bit of unfair punishment. Yeah, I, I think that she doesn't really need to read the article to have a good idea of what it says, given Harry's history of trying to out this information. Something that I think might have been a missed opportunity, though is I I understand that the article was about Voldemort's return and the Death Eaters, but it also would have been a great opportunity for Harry to out Umbridge's detention practices. Like, hey, Dolores Umbridge is literally causing physical distress on students during detentions, and I have the scars to prove it. That would have been great. That should have been Mm -hmm. like a a follow-up interview in the Quibbler. Now the tell-all about Umbridge. Yeah, she would have gotten sacked at the end of the chapter instead of uh, Trelawney. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah, you think so, because parents would read this and they would not be cool with it at all. By the way, there was a really great line from Fred in the scene where Umbridge comes up to them and asks what's going on. And Fred just says, is that a crime now? Said Fred loudly, getting mail. (laughs) Yeah, it was just um, like such a quick retort. And kind of to the point that Lee Jordan brought up in the last chapter, Umbridge shouldn't be talking to Harry about anything other than classes. Yeah, exactly, Umbridge. Follow your own rules, Umbridge. But she's the high inquisitor, so she can do what she wants. Mm -hmm. But I like that idea, Laura, about putting in the quibbler in this article about how she is really physically harming students and 
to the point, there's evidence to prove it. They could have put a picture of the back of Harry's hand or the back of Lee Jordan's hand or anybody mm-hmm. else who's been in detention with her over the course of the last couple of months. Yeah. There's physical evidence. So yeah, I don't think Fudge would have had any choice but to get rid of her. And it's also, you know, it's very much related to the Voldemort narrative because Umbridge started doing this to stop Harry from talking about Voldemort. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. So, of course, it's not long until Umbridge comes up with another educational decree, number 27, which basically states that the possession of the Quibbler results in a student's expulsion. Now, when I'm reading this as an adult versus when I read it, you know, however long ago it was, I'm thinking about things like freedom of speech, freedom of the press, and they're both being denied here. Laura, what what are your thoughts here about banning certain reading materials. We could even throw in how a lot of schools around the U.S. banned Harry Potter for a period of time because they thought it inspired Mm -hmm. witchcraft. Yeah. Which is crazy. Yeah, this is this is very true. And and you can also connect it to again, I know I I harp on this a lot, but, um, you know, there have been numerous examples throughout history where oppressive tyrannical governments target institutions of education in order to prevent people from, you know, broadening their minds and potentially becoming adversaries of said tyrannical government. So Umbridge is really, um, she's really bringing down that like, like iron fist like uh, tyranny Mm -hmm. on Hogwarts for sure. Totally. But as is the case with anything that you try and ban, especially in the case of an article, if you're looking to try and prevent people from reading it, the worst thing you could possibly do is ban it because now everybody is going to want to read it. And that's exactly what ends up happening. And similarly, Andrew, you actually got a note from one of your listeners, or one of our listeners, <laughs> Not she's not just your listener. She only listens to me on MuggleCast. Yeah, clearly. Uh, <laughs> Josie, she wrote in to, to actually make a pretty interesting comparison to what happens here with the Quibbler article. Right. So as Hermione points out, um, everybody wants to read this interview because Umbridge banned it. And Josie writes, I know this is several years late, but I wanted to share my thoughts with you about J.K. Rowling's Wormtaily tweet accusing Hypable of posting cursed child spoilers. I completely understand Andrew's reaction to the situation, but as the conversation continued, I was surprised that none of the other hosts or listeners mentioned or connected the situation to Chapter 6 of Order of the Phoenix. I think J.K. Rowling intended for her tweet about Hypable to do exactly what Umbridge unintentionally did with her educational decree about the Quibbler. I think she knew there was no possible way she could ever keep people from reading spoilers about Chris Child, so she did what she could to direct fans toward the harmless teasers on Hypable in the hopes that it would distract them away from the blatant spoilers posted in other places. Rather than condemning Hypable, I think it was actually more of a sneaky endorsement. (laughs) <laughs> she's absolutely right because for anyone who doesn't remember when jk rowling called out my website hypable for posting cursed child spoilers the thing was we had only posted what houses albus and scorpius and rose were sorted into completely mild spoilers and we hid them behind headlines it's not like we went on twitter and said guess what y'all albus severus is a slytherin what a shocker am i right no we didn't do that So, yeah, I think this is a very interesting theory. I think she did encourage people to go to Hypable on purpose, despite saying don't visit Hypable, um, and then directed people away from, uh, God, what sites were, I guess, Tumblr. Tumblr was a thing back in 2016. There were spoilers all over Tumblr, very detailed spoilers. And it kind of ruined the story because you're just getting all these out of context uh spoilers about the play like like bellatrix and voldemort had a baby (laughs) like you read that out of context it's crazy or you hear about all the time turner usage it's crazy so yeah good theory josie yeah i love this theory i would love to know if this was something that joe had in the back of her mind yeah by the way everybody my birthday is coming up and i still do not have a framed print of that tweet from jk rowling so If anybody would like to do that for my birthday, I want that and a vibrating broomstick. (laughs) (laughs) We're on it. Don't worry. Well, I think we're on the vibrating broomstick. Laura, Eric, and I will do our best to take care of that. Yes. Coordinate with Pat. 
Okay, yeah. <laughs> A- after the show, yep. we'll work on that for you, Andrew. Well, uh, we'll wrap it up just like uh, Harry's uh, firebolt was wrapped up when it arrived at the table. Yeah, right. <laughs> and and everybody was supposed to not know what it was. <laughs> yeah. Make sure the batteries are not included because we don't want the delivery person to like accidentally turn it on. <laughs> Speaking of uh, this comparison... Andrew, uh, one other thing about the quibbler that I thought was cool, and thanks to Pat uh, for correcting this. That, that's why Pat, you know, it's, it's great to have him on the show. Uh, the checking. students, <laughs> yeah, I know. The students actually bewitch the quibbler so that it looks like the pages of it are actually pages from their textbooks. And I thought this was actually pretty cool. Yeah, that was a, that was a very clever way of hiding it. Yeah, it's ingenious. It, it actually reminded me of like, a show nowadays where, and, and I'm sure there's a million examples, but you know something breaks on social media, and then you could have all these different cut scenes of like the girls are in the bathroom, and like they're all. I mean, even Hermione mentions this, right? Like all the stalls are closed, but like people are in there reading it, and then in the hallways, these kids are bewitching their textbooks to look like. like so they're all consuming it, right? Like it's mm-hmm. kind of comparable to nowadays. Imagine if social media existed during this. Uh, <laughs> People, people would get like alerts on their magical cell phones or I don't know how that works. But. And then Umbridge would ban Twitter and all social <laughs> yeah. media platforms, all phones, actually. Mm-hmm. But there there is some positive reaction. We talked a lot about the negative reaction and Harry getting detention and Sprout ends up giving points to Gryffindor just kind of out of nowhere. Flitwick gives Harry some candy Trelawney reverses car- course on, you know, Harry's death omen prediction and says that he's going to live a very long life and have, I think it was 12 kids. Uh, Seamus comes around, right? He says that he now believes Harry and he even sent the article off to his mom. Mm-hmm. And uh, Cho, I mean, Cho like wants to be a boyfriend, girlfriend again. So there, there's some positive that comes of this article. Time to try holding hands again. Yeah, there's a lot of positive that comes from this article. And it was really funny to see J.K. Rowling describing the ways that the teachers were slyly patting Harry on the back. Yeah. But there's the other side where there was some negative reaction from certain students, including those kids who Harry named their fathers as being Death Eaters. And I know this was supposed to be a tell-all article, but did Harry maybe not think it all the way through, knowing that he goes to school with Malfoy, Crabbe, Goyle, and they introduced uh, Theodore Knott in this chapter as well, or make mention of him again, and Harry, of course, gave his father's name as being a Death Eater too. Was, Was this a smart choice on his part? I think so. I think it is, because you... It provides more legitimacy to the story if he would have just said like, oh, there were other prominent people in society there, like that wouldn't have done anything. Like I've been in this situation before too, where you sometimes you just have to lay out all of the facts and not worry about the repercussions because it matters that much to get the truth out there. Mm Mm-hmm. And now people like, you know, Malfoy, Crabbe and Goyle, like the 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 daddy versions of Malfoy, Crabbe and Goyle, you know, they all <laughs> that was maybe not the best way to phrase it. <laughs> um, but, you know, now they are all under a magnifying glass. So everything they do is going to be scrutinized in some way. So I think that this is a good thing. Yeah. And remember, Hermione said that they actually can't get mad at Harry right now. Because that would mean they violated one of these decrees by reading the interview. So it was pretty brilliant. Yeah, that's a great point. Umbridge kind of stepped in it in a way. She did. Yeah, she's starting to lose it a little bit (laughs) in in terms of uh, her reaction. She's not as well thought through, I don't think, as she has been in in prior decrees and prior chapters. Yeah. She has a very knee-jerk reaction, especially to this decree. And as we've discussed, it it only ends up causing more people to read it anyway. Right. But one other thing to uh, to touch on that kind of happened at the beginning of this chapter when when everybody is having breakfast is that Harry and Hermione are talking about his date with with Cho and how it went, and Hermione starts to give Harry some advice about how he should have handled the situation. 
And I'm sitting here, I'm, re- I'm sympathizing with Harry. I- I'm sympathizing with his frustration because I think that she could have been a little bit more helpful in giving Harry some information before, as opposed to sitting here now looking back on it saying, well, you actually should have handled the situation this way. How about Hermione, you shouldn't have asked him to even come see you when you knew he was going to be out on a date with Cho. How about that? Yeah. Problem A, I think Hermione was so distracted by this opportunity to have Rita interview Harry that she didn't think this through, the the Harry Cho date. Uh, Problem B, I don't think Hermione's excuse would have even worked on Cho. Because Hermione says, in hindsight, you should have said it was really annoying, but I, Hermione, made you promise to come along to the three broomsticks. I don't think that would have made Cho feel any better because Harry is still picking Hermione over Cho. He doesn't have to go meet Hermione, no matter how annoying she is. He can be annoying back by not going on Valentine's Day to the three broomsticks with another girl. So I, I, don't, I don't think Hermione's excuse was a good one either in hindsight. But Hermione also says that she should have, or he should have had Cho come with him, which I do think would have been good because Harry's never really said the entire story to Cho because she always ends up crying. <laughs> um, so she'd be able to sit there and listen to the interview as well and really like have that sort of like, I guess, sort of public situation of hearing the story where maybe she'd be able to understand it better set aside her emotions a little bit to really understand what harry went through yeah and i think if she had come and realized the importance like the magnitude of what harry was doing here she wouldn't have been upset anymore she would have realized oh this isn't about meeting another girl this is about getting the truth about what happened to cedric out there yeah um but i i do think though I agree. I think Hermione could have prepped Harry a little better for this. But I think that her explanation of, you know, how this could have been different, I think it's pretty on point. You know, Cho is, um, you know, she's going through a lot, which, of course, amplifies things. But she's a bit super superficial, right? Like, she wanted to go on this, like, very showy Valentine's Day date where they went to this place that was just like overwhelmingly romantic and had couples making out all over the place. She was really she really was laying it on thick with that. Right. And I think that if Harry had really laid it on thick and returned him like, oh, God, yeah, I just have to do this. Please come with me. It'll make it so much better if you're there. I think that would have worked. Mm. Yeah. And Harry, I mean, honestly, Harry is dumb in some Mm -hmm. situations. And Hermione's been his best friend for five years now. She knows how Harry's mind works. She should have known that he wasn't going to come up with something to tell Cho. So Hermione should have laid this story out beforehand. Mm -hmm. Amy, who is listening live on Patreon right now, has an interesting theory. She says, Hermione is friends with Ginny, and she knows Ginny likes Harry. Did she do it to undermine the date with Cho? Ooh, I kind of like that. I don't that. think so. <laughs> but at this point, Ginny's been dating other guys, so... True. I don't know. True. And Hermione, um, if we recall, I think we find out in book six, Hermione was the one telling Ginny she needed to move on. Mm. Hermione's just a matchmaker. We don't realize it. <laughs> <laughs> well, one thing she doesn't like, or at least appears not to like in this chapter, is Quidditch. And she says that it creates bad blood between the Hogwarts houses. This pisses off Fred and George and Harry. And um, what do we make of this? Like Hermione, she seems like she's pretty passionate about Quidditch. At least she's not like talking down on it through all the books prior to this. So yeah. what do we think is causing her to be so angry with it right now? And And I don't disagree – with the point about creating bad blood, but is it bad blood or is it just like rivalry? Is it is it sports? You know, I, I don't I don't really think that Quidditch by itself creates bad blood. I think the whole idea of sorting students into different houses that could create bad blood, and and Quidditch is just an extension of that. Mm-hmm. I think her frustration with Quidditch right now is mostly stemming from owls. 
because they're coming up. We're getting towards the end of the school year. She's seen how they've all prioritized Quidditch over their studies, especially four owls. So I think she's just over it and wants to focus on her academics and thinks that the boys should too. Yep. I was going to say, you know, she's really exaggerating what she thinks is more important here. Mm. And I think it's it's causing her to sort of diminish the importance of Quidditch. I also agree with you, Micah, to a point about, yes, this is life. This is sports. There are rivalries. But I'm thinking about this in terms of like going through high school myself. There weren't matches against other grade levels in my high school, for example. It was against another high school. You're pitting people against each other in the same school, which I think amplifies the tension and the rivalry and the potential drama. Right. But doesn't that all stem from the fact that you're sorting them into houses when they first get there? Like Quidditch is is just the byproduct or one of the byproducts of the fact that this is how the school operates, right? Right, right. Four houses against each other. Like, do you think it gets this intense if- people from different houses are playing gobstones against each other? <laughs> no, but there's there's a cup involved no. here. <laughs> True. And, and don't the Quidditch points go towards the house cup at the end of the year too? I don't know. Maybe they get some points towards it. But, uh, but in o- another way to think of this is, again, this high school example, we are all one. Like, we all had a mascot in high school, right? Mine was the Renegade, which has not aged well. Um, but we were one renegade <laughs> at Hogwarts. You don't hear them saying we are one Hogwarts. We are Gryffindor. We're Slytherin. We're, we're Ravenclaw. They're splitting people up. And that's interesting because especially in Goblet of Fire, you see more alignments, I think, taking place between these international schools like within with the Hogwarts houses than you do within Hogwarts itself, right? There is no like unifying factor, maybe with the exception of Cedric. Everybody loves him, even Slytherin. But that's but Slytherin only loves Cedric because they don't like Harry. So, you know, I just feel like there's more bonding that's taking place um, with with Durmstrang and and Bobaton than there is with Ravenclaw and Hufflepuff. So, like, but again, like that's all what it's about. I guess it's about competition and everybody's competing against each other. And um, but I think also for Harry, it's a sore point because. You know, he's looking at th- through the lens of the fact that this is yet another thing that he is barred from doing because of Umbridge. Mm-hmm. And uh, he even says he would have rather jumped off the astronomy tower than admit it to Hermione. He would have given any number of galleons not to care about Quidditch either. But obviously, it's something that he cares deeply about. It's been something he's been good at since he's gotten to Hogwarts. And I, and I love the uh, jumping off the astronomy tower reference uh, because. We know what happens in the next book. (laughs) Was was that on purpose? Did J.K. Rowling do that on purpose? I hope not. Well, doesn't is it Fred or George in the next book that also makes a similar reference to the Astronomy Tower? I don't know if it's just like a running joke at Hogwarts about jumping or falling off the Astronomy Tower, but maybe that's what kind of gave (laughs) J.K. Rowling the idea for Half-Blood Prince to have Dumbledore fall off of it. I don't know. It could be a maybe it's native advertising for uh, the hit new ride at Universal Studios. I agree. I completely agree. <laughs> Dumbledore's magical astronomy tower of terror freefall. <laughs> also, just I just did a quick Google tallest tower at Hogwarts, and according to Google, it's the astronomy tower. So maybe it is just a running joke at school about the tallest tower at Hogwarts, since that's the one. That's why we keep hearing about it. Something I thought was kind of a a fun throwback to Prisoner of Azkaban, though, in regards to Quidditch, Um, Gryffindor makes massive Quidditch comebacks in Prisoner of Azkaban and in Order of the Phoenix. So this is just another one of those connecting the thread moments between these books. You know, in Prisoner of Azkaban, uh, Oliver Wood is lamenting the fact that Gryffindor has not won the House Cup in seven years, and they finally do it in Prisoner of Azkaban. And then we know the comeback that's coming for the Gryffindor team later on in Order of the Phoenix, which is pretty satisfying given how badly Quidditch goes in this chapter. Mm, Definitely. So let's switch gears a little bit. Let's talk about some of Harry's dreams. There's two of them that happen in this chapter. 
And uh, the first one is a little bit trippy. I don't know what Harry was eating or drinking or smoking before he went to bed, <laughs> but he was smoking yeah. stress. He's stressed yeah, and happy, maybe, but also maybe that's it. Yeah. Uh, dream number one is about Neville and Professor Sprout waltzing around the room of requirement while McGonagall plays the bagpipes. Yeah. Sounds like a start to a fan fiction that I don't want to read. <laughs> when I read this for the first time in 2003, this confirmed to me that Neville would become the herbology teacher and that Minerva would become headmaster because I study dreams and I know that if anyone's ever playing bagpipes, that means they have a bright future in a high position ahead of them. <laughs> and if you waltz as a student, you become the teacher who you are also waltzing with. Mm. Wow, Confirmed. this is some Trelawney level uh, dream interpretation happening here. Yeah, this is. Thank you, Laura. <laughs> <laughs> I just think that somehow in Harry's mind, he did the unfathomable and found a way to be able to waltz to bagpipe music, which <laughs> it's impossible. So I don't know how he did it, but he did. I'm so glad Pat was on an episode where he got to say bag in his Wisconsin accent for everybody. <laughs> Big pipes. I, Andrew, I thought that was like, there was so much confidence behind what you just said. Like, I actually believe it. So <laughs> good. Let's move on. Then. What, what do you have to say <laughs> don't about, even debate it. about the doors <laughs> afterwards? Harry walks out and then he's in that corridor that uh, he's been seeing for quite some time. Mm. I, I didn't make much of that. I, I really enjoyed your interpretation, though, of the. Yeah, the doors were boring. Neville yeah, and Sprout who cares about the doors. We've seen them That's before. Fun. Yeah. Blah, blah, blah. Think of something new. Yeah. All right. Let's go on to the, the second dream where Harry is actually Voldemort. This was cool. <laughs> cool. Yeah. No. You're sick. First he was Nagini. Now he is Voldemort. Like he's just. Yeah. I mean, that was a quick jump. He's... I mean, he didn't even go to like a Death Eater in between. Like he's, he's <laughs> that not Voldemort. That escalated quickly. <laughs> yeah, totally. And uh, we see a scene play out between Voldemort and Rookwood, who we know from the last chapter has just escaped from Azkaban. And he is providing information to him about the Department of Mysteries. And we learn that there was a little bit of a mess, misstep on the part of one of the other Death Eaters named Avery, who provided information to Voldemort that Broderick Bode would have been able to retrieve the prophecy. And Rookwood is very adamant about the fact that that could not be the case. So Voldemort's kind of pissed off that he's been wasting time over the course of the last few months to no avail. Mm-hmm. And there's some detective work that's done on the part of Hermione a little bit later on in the chapter. Uh, but we do learn that Lucius Malfoy placed Broderick Bode under the Imperious Curse to try and retrieve the prophecy. And uh, if he had come to in the hospital, he would have likely been able to provide too much information to, let's say, the ministry, assuming the ministry would believe him, uh, about what mm -hmm. was going on. And we also learn... Sturgis Podmore was Voldemort's first attempt earlier in the summer to gain access uh, to the Hall of Prophecy. So there's a lot of uh, underhanded work going on here by Voldemort, as to be expected. But Hermione hears all this, and I think she makes a mistake. She <laughs> says that Harry shouldn't tell anybody. Yeah. I disagree. Mm -hmm. I, I agree for a couple reasons. One, for the reasons we've discussed over the past few months, but also... What information do we think Rookwood is giving Voldemort here? Could it potentially be that Voldemort needs to lure Harry into the Department of Mysteries? Because if so, this is an awful time for Hermione to be like, let's just forget about all this. Of course, Hermione doesn't know, and they don't even know that about the prophecy, and that's what Voldemort's after. But still, I, the timing of this is, is crazy. So what do you guys think Rookwood might actually be telling Voldemort? I think he's just telling him that one of the people who prophecies are about, they're the only ones that can actually remove it without having anything happen to them. Yep. Agreed. And I kind of had a question here. Is knowledge about prophecy really that sort of like locked down yeah like obviously people wouldn't we they wouldn't know the intricacies of prophecies and being able to access the hall of prophecies is obviously you know something that is very specialized you probably have to have some like dod level of clearance to do it but 
it, it seems like just from like a public knowledge perspective, it, knowing like, oh, yeah, only people that prophecies are about can touch the prophecies. Like, it's surprising to me that that's not more general knowledge. Right. Or even something Voldemort would know by now. Yeah. I mean, okay, yeah, Neville might not know that because he's Neville. But Voldemort, he should have learned about that a while back. Don't hate on Neville, man. He's getting into his, you know. <laughs> he's getting it. Yeah. Doing that waltz. He works, bitch. <laughs> <laughs> he waltzes the work, bitch. <laughs> well, I can kind of see, though, that the knowledge, like that kind of general knowledge about prophecies going away because seers are becoming more and more rare. A lot of people consider divination and seers to be just kind of like, I don't know, wishy-washy magic. So I think the legitimacy of being a seer is going away. And I think that just is translating now into the population where people don't really care about prophecies anymore. Mm. I also think it, it is possible that that Voldemort could know this, but yet he wants to make an attempt where he doesn't have to physically take himself to the ministry and and risk exposure. So he's trying to utilize somebody like Broderick Bode who works in that department. Mm -hmm. And maybe there's some special thing about unspeakables that they're able to retrieve these prophecies without the actual person being there. So I think there is a the potential for Voldemort to know this information, but he just doesn't want to take such a high risk at this point. Um, that mm. said, he seems pretty pissed off uh, that Avery gave him the wrong information. So I, I do think there there's a there's definitely some lack of information that's being provided here. And if this is in fact the moment where Voldemort makes the decision that he's going to have to lure Harry there because it's probably easier for Harry to retrieve the prophecy again than it is for him to risk exposure, it's a huge mistake on the part of Hermione to tell Harry not to share this information. Right. Because again, this is a recently escaped Death Eater from, from Azkaban who is providing Voldemort with important information. And I also wonder too, like Snape kind of gets a glimpse of this and how much information is he taking back to Dumbledore and, and others about what he's seeing inside of Harry's head? I would, I would think Dumbledore mm. would expect like a report. Yep. Yeah. Especially if Snape sees something like this. He doesn't really care about Harry being pushed into the toilet by Dudley. But this, this is important. Totally. And and I think that takes us to these occlumency lessons. Well, I just also just want to say goodbye, Avery. I never liked your paper products. I'm kind of glad <laughs> that you're getting out of here. Yeah, I, I think uh, he is done for. He's done for. I can never figure out the labels, which which are which. I don't get the, <laughs> the, the numbering scheme. Well, see, what you don't realize, Andrew, is that this was Avery's second calling. Um, oh. After things went south with Voldemort, he decided to, you know, go form his own label making company. I see. And he's apparently just as bad at that as he was at his last job. So the envelopes say 8160, but then there's also 4140. Which is it? I can't tell which template I'm supposed to be using. <laughs> <laughs> How do we think that uh, Harry is doing progress wise with occlumency? Doesn't seem like he's doing all that well until a little bit later on in this chapter. Yeah. yeah. Not great, Bob. I mean, this is an important step forward because he can penetrate Snape's mind and even Snape is surprised by this. Mm -hmm. um, but no, he has not been progressing very well. And it's partly because of the teacher and partly because Harry, well, Snape's right. Harry might not be taking this as seriously as he should be. Mm -hmm. But I do equally blame Snape, if not more so. Yeah. I mean, I think... Part of the blame also, I mean, I think it rests on Dumbledore, too. Yeah. You know, you can trace Harry's sort of level of interest in this to the fact that he feels shut out and he feels isolated. And given that all of this concerns him, the fact that he's not getting very much information kind of leaves him, you know, out at sea. He's adrift and he's like, OK, like. I need to close my mind down to Voldemort because I'm not really sure why, you know, what he would be trying to do. And I think that that honestly just it doesn't give Harry the buy in that he needs in order to focus on this. Yeah. It, it, I mean, he's definitely in a weaker state, too. We've talked about this after each of these lessons and you would right. hope that he would be getting stronger 
as a result, right? Even from one lesson to the next, he's learning how to how to recover. But going back to that memory that he sees of Voldemort and Rookwood, I do wonder if he is in fact sharing this information with Dumbledore because it's clear that Harry is not able to. I I don't think it's a matter of, at least still at this point, of not wanting to close his mind. I just think he's not able to. Mm -hmm. And should we expect a 15-year-old to be able to close his mind to certain thoughts, especially when you have somebody as powerful as Voldemort who is now aware of this connection and can easily manipulate it? I think there's too high of an expectation put on Harry. Yeah. Yeah, definitely a... a significant burden on his shoulders. The other thing that I'll observe is, you know, when Harry was doing his private lessons with Lupin on how to fight the Dementors, Lupin always had chocolate on hand. And as we've seen, consuming chocolate like helps to sort of bolster your mental and emotional strength. Snape isn't doing anything to build Harry up after these sessions. So Harry's just getting torn down again and again and again, and it's weakening him over time. Give Harry a scalp massage. (laughs) (laughs) Give Harry chocolate, man. Easy fix. It's so true, though, because there's really just only one moment of recognition, and it's after Harry is able to penetrate Snape's mind where he seems somewhat impressed by what Harry has done, but that's just a fleeting moment and it's gone because Snape's reaction after the fact is just to, let's go for another round, Harry. And Harry knows that he's about to pay for what he was just able to do. Mm -hmm. Which again, like that's not the dynamic that should be going on here, right? Like to your point about Lupin, and, and again, we know that they're very different people, but Lupin had a way of building Harry up, as you said. Snape just seems like he's been given a task that he really doesn't want to do, but he's going to use every opportunity to his advantage to take down Harry and 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 make him feel even worse than before he walked in the door. Mm-hmm. There was also just a, a a nice little throwback here that I wanted to call out um, when Snape was seeing the flashes of Harry's memories. One of the memories was from Prisoner of Azkaban where the Dementors are descending on all of them. And the memory specifically at one point focuses on Snape. So like Snape is seeing himself from Harry's vantage point in Prisoner of Azkaban. Mm. I thought that was pretty cool. Yeah. Hmm. Very cool. Harry also enters the Department of Mysteries and I was wondering how how is this possible in everything that's going on right now? Yeah, that this memory, I, I really a vision. I'm not sure what to call it. Just kind of pops up. And Harry, I don't think has experienced this before, right? This is something completely new. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think it's because we know that Voldemort is very skilled at legitimacy, so he's either gotten those visions or thoughts, whatever, from Avery or Rookwood previously. And because Harry and Voldemort have that connection, he's probably seen it somewhere in his subconscious. Cool. Like, seen that from Voldemort's mind. And that's why he's able to move forward in it. And I think at this point, Voldemort is starting to realize that connection a little bit and maybe has started to, I guess, give Harry more information to move forward. So it's like he's feeding him certain memories or certain visions. Yeah. Uh. Hmm. And I th- I think it, it or it could be the part that Harry is curious. Harry wants to see where it's going, so he just may have accessed that from Voldemort's mind just because his subconscious is like I want to go further through these doors, so he got that information mm. that way. My other guess would have been he did get through those doors during a dream, but for whatever reason he just didn't remember that part. Maybe he like blacked out within a dream once he got through the doors. Because, yeah, this doesn't make much sense to me. I like Pat's theories, though. Yeah, I like Pat's theories as well. Mm-hmm. Okay, we'll uh, go with this. Yeah. <laughs> I am canon. <laughs> uh, well, we touched a little bit upon how Harry is able to defend himself in one moment uh, in these lessons. And it's a bit of payback for Snape, though we know that the memories that Snape definitely would not want to be accessed are being put in the pensive. So... 
Um, it's interesting though that he's willing to have these memories even be viewed, even if by accident when Harry uh, throws up that spell. Yeah. Well, it, but what is he going to do? Take out take out every single memory from his head? Like that would that's be true. Probably impossible. But we do get a bit of insight into Snape's childhood. Yeah. It says that a hook-nosed man was shouting out at a cowering woman while a small dark-haired boy cried in a corner. A greasy-haired teenager sat alone in a dark bedroom, pointing his wand at the ceiling, shooting flies down. A girl was laughing as a scrawny boy tried to mount a bucking broomstick. So a boy was transforming into a vampire <laughs> to his father's delight. Well, the problem with this broomstick was it was a vibrating broomstick. If only he had known. <laughs> A bucking group. Yeah, is that like when you try and ride a bull at one of those bars? It just tosses you around. <laughs> it's like, get off. <laughs> get off, yeah. Uh, but yeah, Snape seems very vulnerable in these visions that Harry, these memories that Harry is seeing, especially the fact that he's crying in a corner at one point. Yeah, yeah. And Snape doesn't want Harry to see this. Snape's tough. He's strong. He doesn't have any problems in his life. Mm -hmm. No, I mean, this This makes total sense. Somebody does not end up like Snape without a serious amount of trauma in their childhood. There's just no way. There's no way you end up with that hair after a good life. <laughs> yeah, and, and presumably his father was abusive to his mother, if, if, if not physically, verbally, and... Snape mm. was witness to a lot of this. Mm. And, and I think we see the transition, right? Like he is now, in his teenage years, he's very isolated. He's by himself in his room yeah. and he's just kind of like, doesn't have much to do. And it's kind of sad. Yeah. I mean, in this very brief moment we get within Snape's mind, we learn three very large things that you're touching on. His dad may have been a bully. He was bullied. and he was isolated and didn't have any friends. Mm -hmm. And that's that's a lot yeah. in one little paragraph. Yeah. So he turned into a bully. Right. Yeah. And I think this has even like a bigger insight and relates him a lot to Voldemort because wasn't it? Yep. Snape's dad was the muggle. So I think like his the way that he saw his dad treating his mom is part of the reason why he joined Voldemort's side because he just hated the way that muggles treated wizards. Um, the same way that Voldemort was like, just thought his dad was awful and wanted to kill him. Yeah, totally. And we will never know what was to come after that because their lesson gets interrupted. Now, I don't know how it's possible for them to hear a woman kind of like screaming all the way up in like the entry to the great hall when they're down in the dungeons. I am, am Am I like not thinking right here? But it just seems like an, a mistake to me, but we can move past The that. walls are paper thin in Hogwarts. We're talking about like a castle here, right? Like uh, it's a small point. We can move on from it, but. Okay. Well, it, but the, the voices might echo through the halls and. Yeah. And Trelawney's is very loud in the movie, yeah. at least. Mm -hmm. She has her moments. So. Well. This moment, I thought, with Trelawney really shows Umbridge's vindictive nature, uh, more so than maybe all else with the exception of, of her detentions, just in how she's treating a fellow human being. And I just think it also speaks to the overall condition of Hogwarts right now, right? You kind of have all of the students huddled around. It's very disorganized. The professor's don't know what they can and can't do. Dumbledore isn't there. And in the midst of all this, you have Trelawney just completely breaking down because she's been sacked from Hogwarts. It's sad. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Also, I want to point out, Micah, that bats have very good hearing. Oh, that's, <laughs> so that's probably another yeah. reason Snape could hear. So good, good call. Yeah, but this is a very sad scene. It's very... The students and the professors at Hogwarts, I think, f feel defeated. Now, of course, there was a good plan in place from Dumbledore that we'll talk about in a moment. But mm -hmm. yeah, this is a very defeating moment for both Reader and Harry and a lot of the teachers. I mean, the humiliation and the secondhand embarrassment that I feel from reading this scene, you know, Umbridge literally having her, having Trelawney's trunks 
tossed out and telling her she's got to go as, you know, presumably hundreds of students stand around and spectate. Um, that's just awful. Yeah, she makes... She's going to get a lot of suck count updates today. <laughs> I'll tell you that. Get ready, Umbridge. Yeah, she makes quite the spectacle of all of this. And um, I wonder if the Quibbler situation maybe forced her hand a little bit more. Maybe it, it, it pushed her to make decisions more quickly than she otherwise would have. We knew that this was probably coming at some point, but yeah. I wonder if this expedited her decision making. Mm -hmm. um, it shows that Umbridge still has control at the school. She kind of fumbled when this interview with Harry occurred, but now she's kicking out a teacher. She's still got it. She's still got things under control at Hogwarts. Mm -hmm. She also needs, um, she needs distraction fodder, right? Right. Make everybody so. forget about this interview that Harry did. Mm -hmm. Well, it is something in this chapter that is kind of weird. Like, as I was rereading it again yesterday, this chapter takes place over an entire month. So, like, the Quibbler comes out in the beginning of the chapter. Trelawney is fired a few weeks later. So, if she's still harboring all of this a couple weeks later, like, girl, you got to... <laughs> relax somehow like go pet those kittens drink some more tea <laughs> just take some chamomile calm down yeah yeah uh -oh. i agree with that but i mean th what harry did is like the worst thing that he could do mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in umbridge's mind she's doing everything she can to downplay the idea that voldemort is back she's pretending that is not the case at all and harry goes behind her back and does this and i can see why she would stew over this for weeks yeah, I think it's really interesting to look at sort of the um, disintegration of um, Hagrid and Trelawney's mental states in Prisoner of Azkaban and Order of the Phoenix. Because, of course, in Prisoner of Azkaban, Hagrid's profession is coming under fire due to the Buckbeak situation. And he's pretty much drunk the entire book. Um, and we see a very similar thing from Trelawney here in Order of the Phoenix. And there was a really interesting moment in Chapter 6 of Prisoner of Azkaban where she's addressing the fact that, um, you know, students have never seen her before their third year. And she said, I find that descending too often into the hustle and bustle of the main school clouds my inner eye. And we really see Trelawney in the main school a lot more in Order of the Phoenix. And she's like wandering around talking to herself, drunk all the time. And it was just kind of an interesting observation that she had earlier on. And makes me wonder, you know, if there might be a little bit of truth to that statement. I mean, we know that she has made, you know, two, six, two accurate predictions in the past. Hmm. And so is this time that she's being required to spend more, you know, sort of down in the main castle, is this also contributing to the deterioration of her classes? Yeah. No, that that's really cool, that connection. I, I wonder too. Yeah. And and I also thought when I was reading through this chapter, specifically, Dumbledore can't let Trelawney go. Right. Especially now. Yes. I mean, she she holds the key to so much information that mm -hmm. it would be highly dangerous for her to be expelled. Like if you picked any other professor, Dumbledore would probably be like, yeah, you know what? Okay, see ya. Maybe not. Like he's a sympathetic guy, but you get my point. Like if he gets Flitwick go, not the same ramifications as somebody like Trelawney who made the prophecy about Harry and Voldemort being out there. And I think that also ties back to a lot of what we learn about in Prisoner of Azkaban. Um, at least. Mm -hmm. Well, and remember, Dumbledore hired her because of that prophecy to begin with. He didn't want to hire her. And then she makes this prophecy and he's like, oh, I got to hire her to protect her. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so yeah, but agreed, especially now. And I wanted to bring this up later. He needs to keep her at the school for her own safety. Voldemort would come after her if, if she was banished to uh, Hogsmeade or wherever else. Mm-hmm. There was also a fun thing I noticed in Chapter 6 of Prisoner of Azkaban when they're reading the tea leaves. Um, Ron is reading Harry's tea leaves and he says, there's a blob a bit like a bowler hat. Maybe you're going to work for the Ministry of Magic. <laughs> and of course, that that's more of a cursed child connection. Yeah. Yeah. 
um, but still fun. I was like, wow, so she really did think this through. <laughs> <laughs> See, Cursed Child is canon. Yeah. Well, I mean, with the exception of the whole Voldemort Bellatrix winged love child bit, uh, I don't know about that. Yeah. But. Well, I swear, if if you go back in the order or the Goblet of Fire movie and you you go to the the first task uh, with the dragon, you can see Albus and Scorpius in the crowd. They're there. <laughs> <laughs> Just have to look very oh, closely. I wish that were true because then uh, everybody would accept Cursed Child as canon. <laughs> everybody would absolutely love it. <laughs> but we uh, should Photoshop them in. Actually, oh, I'm sure there's do that. There's a way to do that. Yeah. Listener totally. challenge of the week. Remember we used to do those? Listen to challenge. Yeah. That, there there's a go. throwback. And I also want fan art of Snape giving Harry a head massage. <laughs> Thank you. That, that might be a bit too far. But I, actually, you know what? That might already exist somewhere. Umbridge thinks that she has the upper hand until the doors open and Dumbledore appears and he's like, got you, bitch. <laughs> It was a because, really cool visual that J.K. Rowling described. Yeah, it was. Dumbledore standing in the front doors. It's a misty night behind him, and Harry was impressed by this striking visual. Oh, I wish we saw that in the movie. Yeah, instead we got that terrible line delivery. Yeah, do you want to talk about that? Because I, I agree. Like that line was awful. Yeah, when Dumbledore, after he like saves Trelawney, is like, "No, nah, you can live here." Blah blah blah, and then he just screams at all of the students. Like, yeah, don't you have studying to do? Like, really, Dumbledore would not do that, right? Yeah, that I I said for me that was second to. Did you put your name in the Goblet of Fire when he's screaming yeah. at Harry yeah. in the trophy room? Like those two lines are up there as not being Dumbledore lines. Yeah, and this is why Michael Gambon got this for sure. uh, reputation as being the angry Dumbledore, which didn't check out with what we saw in the books and what it's we didn't see this with Richard Harris's Dumbledore either. If Richard Harris had lived to uh, star in the remainder of the Harry Potter movies, I think we maybe would have seen a much different Dumbledore. <sighs> yeah. Yeah, Michael Gambon didn't become book Dumbledore until movie six. Yeah. Agree. Yeah. I, I will say in his defense, I think part of that is to be blamed on directing. Definitely. And the screenwriting. Mm -hmm. it's, I'm not blaming Michael Gambon. I'm I'm blaming yeah. th this production team. Yeah, I agree. Well, he also should have read the books. <laughs> That's helpful. <laughs> <laughs> A little bit. You know, it helps inform the uh, the story. Now that you say that, Andrew, it makes me think too, Richard Harris, like, can you imagine him? Just his presence as Dumbledore in the first two movies I thought was so good. And then totally, you, you're, the moment you mentioned, like when the doors opened with, um, you know, just seeing Dumbledore kind of silhouetted against the night sky, I feel like Richard Harris would have been great in that scene. Definitely. I will play devil's advocate in defense of Dumbledore in the movie in that particular moment. I mean, he did just witness one of his teachers almost get fired and Umbridge has been driving him up a wall. So it does make sense that Dumbledore would kind of lose his temper. I don't like it, but I think it can be defended. But it shouldn't be directed at the students though. Like that's the thing. Like his frustration his should be directed at the professor. I get it. Not the students. Hey. But yeah, I can see him being frustrated because everybody's just kind of huddled around and making making probably Trelawney feel a lot worse than she otherwise would right you know, she doesn't happening in front of all these kids exactly mm -hmm. but dumbledore steps in and he's like you cannot banish her from the grounds yeah and now meet our new divination teacher friends a centaur <laughs> yeah somebody you hate somebody whose friends are gonna have fun with you later on in this book <laughs> I personally always loved the idea of Ferenz as a divination teacher. I love reading those chapters. I love the way that his classroom was all set up. I I just, I don't know. For some reason, the first time I even read this book back in whatever year that was when it came out, it was like, I don't know. Something about him was always fascinating as a teacher. I do think there's a bit of a plot hole with these educational decrees because Umbridge is able to whip out this Quibbler decree within hours of the Quibbler interview being published. But then Dumbledore is jumping through some holes in one of these previous decrees saying, ah, you only get to appoint a teacher if I am unable to. Well, I am able to. 
why was that hole there for for Dumbledore to take advantage of? And why didn't Umbridge fix that that night? I'm sure she's going to make adjustments moving forward. This is not going to be able to stand. We know that. She's going to essentially take over not too long from now as as the headmaster, headmistress. Yeah. So I, I think she's learning as she goes. I, I you know, and I, I think early on she was willing to let some of these decrees be a little bit more open ended. But now, given everything that's going on, I think she's going to get a lot more specific. Like even the Quibbler decree, that's very specific. It's it's specifically about the Quibbler, right? And, and, and it escalates very quickly. We'll be immediately expelled. <laughs> well, and I don't think she had the foresight to see or to even imagine that Dumbledore would hire like a Mm non-human as a professor. So I think that that was just like, that thought never crossed her mind. Right. And isn't the whole ability to replace teachers that's coming soon with Hagrid, right? When she's, she's going to be the one to make the decision as to who replaces him, Mm -hmm. not, yeah, not Dumbledore. Mm. Uh, because clearly, there's so many different levels at which this is insulting to Umbridge. The first being that he's obviously flexing his muscle in front of her and the students, saying you can't banish her from the grounds, but also stepping in to replace Trelawney and to do so with a centaur, which we know Umbridge absolutely loathes any creatures that aren't considered humans, and even humans she despises right. that aren't pure blood. So. This is really like mm-hmm. Dumbledore sticking it to Umbridge the best he possibly can. It makes you wonder if Dumbledore had a backup list of other professors for each class, just in case this happened to anybody else. I mean, he saw the writing on the wall with Trelawney and Hagrid, but maybe he had a little backup plan for everybody. And convenient. He does this the very night, the very moment that Trelawney is being banished. He shows up with friends. What coincidence? He saw it coming. He's a seer himself. Maybe. Yeah, he read it in his little smoke dial thing. (laughs) Let's check in on the Umbridge suck count. We're currently at 56 before the events of today's chapter. First of all, she gets one for looking at Harry during the Quidditch match and smiling at him, taunting him, being like, ha ha, you're not playing right now. Look at what I did. (laughs) How about for banning Harry from Hogsmeade and giving him detention? That could actually be two, honestly, because it's two punishments, right? Or are we keeping it as one? What do we think? Um, I, she particularly sucks this chapter. I think two is fair. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, and she also takes 50 points away from Gryffindor because of his interview, too. Add it to the list. This is going <laughs> to... I'm losing track. Oh, my gosh. They're <laughs> this is piling gonna get... up increasingly more brutal (laughs) every week as we get towards the end of this book yeah oh yeah what else definitely giving her one for educational decree number 27 and banning the quibbler yep that's an automatic and for sacking trelawney and making a big scene for no reason i mean she could have gotten rid of her without all the theatrics Mm -hmm. (laughs) okay now it's time for mvp of the week I'm going to give mine to Dumbledore for protecting Trelawney from eviction and using friends as an excellent, excellent clapback. My MVP goes to the Quibbler for finally exposing the truth, telling Harry's story. I think educational decree number 27 was an unintentional MVP of the week because it inspired everybody to look into Harry's interview and thus shift the tide on his public perception. Interesting. And my MVP of the week is actually going to go to Snape because he set aside his ego of Harry seeing some of his memories and continue to move forward with the lesson for the greater good. And now let's rename the chapter Order of the Phoenix, Chapter 26, Seer Sacked. <laughs> I went with Order of the Phoenix, Chapter 26, Umbridge Undermined. Ooh, I see what you did there. Some nice alliteration. I went with Order of the Phoenix, Chapter 26. You've activated Dumbledore's trap card. <laughs> <laughs> and I went with, in Umbridge's voice, Harry Potter and the Order of the Phoenix, Chapter 26. Hoo-hoo, <laughs> quibbler, schmibbler. <laughs> 
If you have any feedback about today's discussion or you have a question or comment about Chapter 27, send it on in to MuggleCast at gmail.com or use the contact form on MuggleCast.com. You can also send us a voice memo. We love hearing everybody. Just record it with your voice memo app that's already built into your smartphone and email it to MuggleCast at gmail.com. Just try to record in a quiet place and keep your message under 60 seconds. It's time now for Quizage. Last week's question, what topic does Xenophilius tell Luna Harry's story is outselling? And the correct answer, as we discussed on this week's episode, was the crumple-horned snorkak. (laughs) Congrats to Caleb, Jason, Count Ravioli, I Still Miss Sports, Sarah, a.k.a. Weensy, Megan, Sarah, Kate, Jabberwock, and Lass, Lass Tatus. And this week's question. Who retrieves the list of Dumbledore's army members for Umbridge? Uh Uh-oh, SpaghettiOs. Don't forget to follow us on social media. We are MuggleCast on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. You'll be notified about future live events like future live quizage events. We also share show previews, Harry Potter memes, all kinds of things. So again, follow us today, MuggleCast on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. We would also love if you joined our community of listeners at patreon.com slash MuggleCast. By doing so, you'll be helping this podcast thrive. And to thank you, you will receive some magical benefits in return, including a personalized video thank you message from one of the four MuggleCasters, our twice monthly bonus MuggleCast installments, the ability to listen live as we record, and so much more. So again, that's patreon.com slash MuggleCast. We deeply appreciate your support. Thank you, thank you, thank you. We are only weekly right now, thanks to our listeners. And that does it for this week's episode of MuggleCast. Thank you for listening. I'm Andrew. I'm Micah. I'm Laura. And I'm Pat. Bye, everybody. See ya. Bye. Goodbye, everybody. (laughs) 